for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Cameron Marshall. I'm the Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement at Hampton Sydney, and uh, also a graduate of Hampton Sydney from the class of 2012. And uh, tonight we, uh, we have the opportunity to meet with Cooper Anderson, class of 2010, um, who's head winemaker at the Austin Winery. So Cooper, thank you for being with us tonight. We're very excited about this. Um, and uh, we've had a lot of really fun virtual alumni events during this uh, quarantine period over the last three months. And we've tried to add as much variety that's informative and fun. And um, this is one of those great events where we get to have a little bit of fun on a Friday and, uh, you know, enjoy some great wine and hear from yeah. one of our successful entrepreneurs and alumni. Um, so, um, Cooper, I'm going to let you just go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are, where you came from. Um, you know, anything you want to share about your time at Hampton Sydney? Um, sure. You know, I know you already kind of touched on how you got into winemaking, but if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that part of your life and how you helped mm -hmm. start up the Austin Winery, um, I'll just let yeah. you take it from here. It's your show. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, for those of you all that don't know, I, I'm kind of a, a son of the college. My, my father, Dr. Bill Anderson, um, is listening here, recently deposed a uh, chemistry professor of many decades there. Um, his reign of terror has finally come to an end. So, um, yeah, you know, I grew up a little bit of around chemistry, was always kind of afraid of it, uh, really pursued social sciences hard. I do enjoy, you know, rhetoric debate and everything like that. Um, and so I, I pursued that avenue when I was in school. Um, you know, when I moved here, well, basically the challenge was for me growing up and going to school in in you know, the town that I lived my entire life, it, I thought it was important to me um, that I get out and I travel a little bit after after school. Um, so luckily, I had some family and, you know, near the Austin area that was willing to put up with me for a little bit, as long as I was I was helping out, um, improving my worth. Uh, shout out to my Uncle Mark for, uh, for, you know, letting me work on some construction projects and stuff like that until I got my feet on the ground down here. Um, when I moved down here, I discovered the Hill Country wine scene. Um, the wine scene here is is old and young at the same time. Um, this was the first region, at least Texas was, I should say, the first area of the country where Vitis vinifera grapes were brought from Europe to the United States. Uh, most of that happened in the 1600s by Spanish missionaries in far west Texas near El Paso. Um, the industry did not necessarily boom from there. You know, these were wines of uh, sacraments, um, other things like that, wines of, of personal enjoyment. It was not any, did not develop into any kind of large commercial endeavor for a long, long time. Truthfully, it really didn't do that until about 40 years ago. Um, you know, but, you know, we have, a, we do have a rich history of winemaking in Texas, uh, despite many, you know, decades of, of dry laws and, you know, you know, California kind of taking the mantle and stealing all the thunder from us and other things like that. Um, so when I kind of discovered a little bit more about that and I was looking for, you know, a, a deeper sense of work rather than just doing odd jobs and waiting to go back to school or seeing if I wanted to go back to school, I wrote to a winery down here asking if I could volunteer uh, at harvest in exchange for my time just to learn a little bit about how to make wine figuring that it would be a valuable uh, lesson for me kind of as as time goes on um, you know and just uh, you know, another opportunity to learn um, which that's that's something I can thank the college for for sure um, and my parents um, both for for imbuing in me an appreciation and love for for travel and globalism um, and you know for and you know installing an endless curiosity so i'm i'm never bored i'm just sometimes my heart rate gets low but uh, there's there's always things to do um if and during this by the way i can see the chat so if i i tend to ramble you've probably gotten that so uh if if you have specific questions as we go along uh feel free to pop them up in the chat um from working part-time at driftwood estate winery which is where i first started uh, I moved from there to work for a winery equipment company called St. Pat's of Texas. And we did a combination of winery, brewery, and, and spirits equipments. Um, we were the second largest 
winery, brewery, and, and spirits equipment store in the country at one point when I was a uh, warehouse manager down there. Um, so I got to learn a little bit of the backside of the wine industry from the technical perspective before I had ever made wine myself. Um, so oh, somebody's asking some questions. Sorry. Um, so from, from there, I was there for two years. My roommate at the time was also in the wine industry, uh, Ross, and uh, he was working for an importer and brokerage selling high-end wines to fancy hotels and restaurants. Um, his mother passed back in 2012 uh, when we were living together and he sold her house in Houston. And that was kind of where we got the seed capital to start and fund our, our initial project. Um, in our first year, we made 125 cases of wine from Texas Grown Merlot. Uh, we also brought on a guest winemaker named Adam Lee who has a label in California called Siduri. Um, Adam makes Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And even though he's in Santa Rosa, California, he was born and raised in Austin. So he kind of partnered up with our project to help us build some inventory in the early stages uh, before we were pulling 100% Texas Grown Fruit. Um, but from that first year, from after, after that first vintage, we've used 100% Texas Grown Grapes. Um, so we can kind of go ahead and, you know, and that was 2013 um, and then 2014 was kind of our first serious commercial vintage uh, where we brought in uh, Merlot Malbec and Petit Verdot um, to make what is our kind of our signature red wine, the workhorse. Um, but then also that year, we also developed one of the labels that we're, we're going to dive into here, the Friends with Benefits. Um, so two things, uh, Lindsay had asked a couple of minutes ago, cool label, where did you get the design? Uh, the artwork is done by a friend of mine. His name is Nicholas Mathis. Um, he does uh, kind of a unique combination of, of pointillism and surrealism. Um, and here we have a, you know, a symbiotic relationship in nature, being that the wine is called Friends with Benefits. Um, it's supposed to be funny, but it does have meaning um, in that these are two two white grapes uh, that we use, one of which is very aroma driven, the other one is very acid driven, and they kind of balance each other out to, to create something that is better than, you know, or that is, you know, the sum of their parts is better than themselves individually. Um, so you have the little little cleaner bird there, which cleans the, the croc's teeth uh, to keep them happy. And in exchange, he does not eat the bird. Um, so, there is that. I highly recommend everybody check out Nick's, Nick's website. It's nicovmathis.com. Um, he does all of our label artwork with the exception of the uh, recent line of wines that we have that have gone into can, which we designed in house. Um, so the first wine we got here, uh, Friends with Benefits, is a blend of 69% Malvasia Bianca and 31% Viognier. So we put the majority of our information on, on our side label here. Um, one of the things you'll find here in Texas is you can find recognizable varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, there's even a little bit of Chardonnay, um, and then you'll find some stuff that, that maybe you had not heard of before, things like Malvasia Bianca, um, which despite being relatively unknown in the American market are actually major uh, historically important grapes. This is a grape of Greek origin. Um, it was used for a long time in trading and was really important in globalizing the wine trade because it's capable of driving up really high sugar, making high alcohol wines, uh, but also high residual sugar wines, which traveled really well and were popular uh, before we really knew anything about what wine stability was. And the whole question was, can we keep it safe and drinking well as wine um, and not let it oxidize on its way to whatever its market is? So Malvasia will climb really high in sugar. Um, so you can make sweet styles from it. You can make fortified styles from it, or you can make a style like this, like we do here, which is sort of your general white table wine, which is picked early to express natural acidity um, and is fermented totally, totally dry. Um, it is balanced out by 31% Albarino. Um, this is a grape that uh, I'm pretty sure it's about to have its moment. Um, so you might not recognize it now, it's kind of gained fame in, in Rias Baixas in Spain, uh, where it claims a uh, famously salty 
taste to it, which they believe is because of the maritime influence. Um, um, in the Texas High Plains, where we get most of our fruit from for the Texas wine industry, about 85% of our grape tonnage is yielded out of the High Plains. That is the area just south of Lubbock, by the way. Um, so if you're imagining the shape of Texas, the panhandle up at the top is sort of the central western part of that, that panhandle. Um, and it's a 9 million acre region in total, um, encompassing a variety of commercial crop from cotton to peanuts, and then thirdly, really, grape production. But grape production has outpaced both cotton and peanuts significantly in the last 10 years as our industry has exploded. Um, but that region, while very boring when you're visiting because it is just so vast and broad and flat, is actually a pretty unique geological feature. Um, it's on, you know, it's, they call it the Caprock Escarpment. It's a big sheet of rock that's 3,100 feet in elevation. Um, it even goes as high as about 4,000 feet in elevation. Um, it is the plains, so it's broad and dry with this characteristic uh, fine red sandy loam soil sitting on top. Um, Well-draining soils are very, very good for grapes. Um, they really enjoy uh, growing in the high plains. Um, the other thing that's nice about the high plains is what we call the diurnals. So warm sunny days and cool nights, its diurnal is really strong from commonly in the mid 90s, at, you know, during our growing season in the spring and summer to commonly in the in the 50s uh, at night. Um, so that nice uh, 300 days per year of sunshine and warm sunny days gives us great photosynthesis to produce sugar and flavor development in our plant. And those cool nights help us to not lose too much of our acidity as we as we develop into our growing season. Um, so one of the, that's again one of the things that's fascinating about grapes is they'll grow in a wide variety of environments from the German Alps to northern Africa to Western Australia uh, to the Texas Hill Country. Um, you know, a wide variety of soil types. Uh, you know, rainfall, other things like that, um, humidity. But you know when one commonality maybe between them all in premium winemaking regions is that diurnal temperature swing. So um, that part for, for what we do here in, in making top, top wine is extremely important. Um, so Friends with Benefits, it's again sort of a, a cross between Maldesia Bianca and Albarino, meant to be sort of your entry level white table wine, uh, ultra refreshing uh, for these long, long summers that we have here. Um, bright, crisp acidity. Uh, we do not acidulate, which is the practice of adding acid to the wine. Um, we choose instead to pick a little bit early if we have to, to express natural acidity. Um, so yeah, for, for this wine, I think it's, uh, this is one that we've produced every year since we've been open and it will definitely continue to be that way. Um, it's now distributed into eight different states. Uh, mostly across uh, the southern part of the United States. Um, but yeah, does everyone like it, first of all? Uh, again, I can see the chat. So if you have questions, please fire away kind of a, as we go here. And I'll walk around a little bit with y'all. I think I'd showed Cameron. Um, I don't have an office, by the way. So uh, I didn't really know where I was gonna do this. I'm currently, currently just in my cellar which houses uh, right now 134 barrels of wine um, and a couple dozen cases of, uh, or a couple dozen pallets, I should say, of cases of wine uh, and even some cans. We've gotten into the can market now. So uh, the other part I like about being back here is that it's quiet. I have customers right now and I don't want to bother them yet. Although if I see some of my favorites out there, we'll go ahead and talk to them. Um, and it's also 55 degrees in here in very stark contrast to the temperature that it is outside currently in Austin. So, all right, we got a question from Gus. Yeah. And as far as wine tasting goes, you know, we take a very casual approach to wine. 
here at the Austin Winery. Um, yet, we will and can answer any question that you do have because not only do I make wine, one of the things that we kind of fancy about ourselves is we consider ourselves an employee-owned winemaking cooperative. So every full-time employee that I have here has a percentage of equity in the company um, that kind of, you know, brings in a, you know, a big sense of loyalty um, and maybe a good, healthy respect for the business side of, of what we do here. Um, but it also gives everyone here a chance to make wine on their own. Uh, let's see here. We got some questions coming in. Ah, oh, there we go. I need to refresh this. All right. All right, cool. So Eric Ritter asked, where do you get your grapes? Um, so Eric, we use 100% Texas grown grapes right now. About 85% of the grape tonnage that I pull in here is yielded out of the High Plains region in the panhandle of Texas. And then in the remaining 15 to 20% every year is from here in the Hill Country. Um, I love both regions for different reasons. Growing grapes here in the Hill Country in Austin is a little bit more difficult than it is in the High Plains. Uh, the disease pressure is significantly higher with our air moisture staying high for most of the year. Uh, we get rain for most of the year. Um, you know, I think uh, here in the city, we'll, we'll typically average in like the mid thirties as far as inches per rain of year, if I remember right. Um, but in the High Plains um, up near Lubbock, uh, last year, for instance, we only got eight inches of rain, most of which will fall um, in the winter. So um, the disease pressure as far as just our ambient moisture, uh, which would cause a threat of mildew, uh, mold or fungus competing on our grapes um, is much lower up there. So as a lower prevalency of fungicides, um, there's a little bit less general organic matter. There's not really that much grass or anything like that. Lower use of herbicides, and there's less pests, so less pesticide too. Um, their temperatures at nighttime fall down a little bit cooler than they do around the Austin area. So they tend to have a little bit better natural acidity than fruit that comes off of the, the vineyards that are immediately surrounding the winery. So I truly love uh, the Texas High Plains as far as, as uh, uh, grape growing goes. It's, uh, it's a really nice region. Number one threat for us is hail. Um, that's the one thing that can really kind of wipe your plans out of growing grapes in the high plains. So, well, we've had five instances of hail this year. Almost all of them have been in about the last two months. Um, we do have newly developed hail netting on three of the four vineyards that we pull from up there now. Um, and, you know, we have to have cooperation from the grower to want to have the hail netting. That's the only reason why we don't have them on all four. And one of our growers takes just a kind of a little bit of like a laissez-faire approach to grape growing. Um, and I don't argue with him too much because he produces his top stuff um, and it's his property. So, um, yeah. So hail is a big factor. Um, I got another question here. Where exactly in Austin are you? We are South Central Austin. Uh, we're just we're just off Congress Avenue um, on uh, just south, south side of 290. Um, so we're about two and a half miles or so south of, uh, directly south of downtown Austin and, and the capital. Um, all right. Uh, my sister chimed in with something. That's good. Really enjoyable. Um, and then Cam asked, why these two wines on the tasting options? Uh, so the first one, the reason these two are on the tasting options, one of them is just very pleasant, easy to drink and enjoyable. Um, and is, is, meant to be enjoyable it's not meant to be you know challenging or intellectual in any way whereas the second one we're going to try is it's going to be polarizing i expect some of y'all to love it and some of y'all to hate it um there's a lot of information that goes with it because it was made in kind of an unusual um, but historically significant way um yeah uh, so matt moore chimed in here he mentioned it was 55 degrees in the cellar so are, are you underground or do you have air conditioning in the cellar we have air conditioning here. Um, when people say cellar temp, they are historically referencing cellars that were dug into mountainsides, hillsides, or into the ground. Um, it is incredibly difficult to dig here because of the amount of, of 
rock in our, our soil. Um, so basements are not common here. Um, other things like that that you know you see commonly in the East Coast. Those little those little things that you don't don't notice necessarily immediately when you're visiting. Um, you know, manifest themselves when you uh, like. For instance, I just bought a home and you know that had never really occurred to me for a really long time. I hadn't seen a basement in Austin. So um, uh, Betsy says I'm interested in the Albarino grape growing in a dry region such as the Panhandle. Albarino originated, I believe, in the Galician region of Spain, uh, maybe the wettest region of Spain, that's right. Um, is this grape especially hardy or versatile? Yes. Um, so while in Europe, they have very tight regulations surrounding the use of irrigation in their vineyards, and you are kind of at your peril if you choose to plant a grape that is not necessarily very drought tolerant, uh, in a very drought stricken region or vice versa. Um, in the United States, we are allowed to irrigate. So uh, we do have drip irrigation in the vineyard. Um, and you know, we sit directly above uh, an aquifer that has really, really great, um, good mineral rich water. Uh, it's pretty high pH water, in fact. Um, and so we have good, good water access in the panhandle despite the ground uh, or the air above ground not ever containing any moisture. Um, once you go deep enough, we do have great soil moisture um, and we do have good water access. So we are allowed to irrigate and use grapes like Alvarino, uh, which ordinarily does thrive in wetter environments, in drier environments here. Um, it will produce a different expression in a drier environment uh, like we have here in Texas. Uh, one of the things that we really have to mitigate uh, with the use of our canopy management is sunburn so that we don't end up with orange or raisin grapes uh, that we bring into the winery when we're trying to make a white wine. Now, there are times when we want to do that purposefully and we'll leaf pull or we'll manage our canopy in a fashion that will maximize sun exposure. But uh, for these light and delicate styles of white wine, uh, like the Albrino that gets crushed into the friends with benefits here, um, we do pretty traditional, what we call vertical shoot positioning and pretty traditional canopy management where we will heavily leaf on the evening side, planting vineyards north to south, leaving thick canopy on the, uh, the sun setting side on our westward side and on our eastern side, leaving a good amount of exposure for more gentle sunlight to come through. Um, so look out for Albarino. Uh, it loves it both here in the hill country. It does pretty well. In the high plains, it does pretty well. So it can take a, a variety of soil types, um, you know, temperatures, everything like that, um, and yield you different but consistently good results for making wine. What's the difference between growing grapes in your region versus in Napa? Um, in Napa, they don't have bad years. So um, this is actually, 2020 was already bullshit, all right? So this is actually a great, a great thing to talk about right now. Um, bad years in making wine. Um, like I mentioned, we've had already five instances of hail. Not great. Um, in October, towards the end of October, beginning of November, in the high plains, they got down to 17 degrees. Um, now, the fruit was, was off the vine. We had pulled everything into the winery, so there wasn't fruit damage, but our vines were not dormant. So buds that were essentially you know, inlay in the wood, it got so cold that they were damaged and they lost their fruiting ability for the following year. So we're seeing that damage manifest now where the frost was so bad that you know, these buds never even came out of, of our vine. And so I would say, you know, off of the back of three really good years, three really good vintages, 2017, 2018, 2019 in a row, I would estimate that in 2020, the Texas wine industry is going to produce less than half of the wine that it did the previous year. That would never happen in Napa. We stay significantly hotter and we get significant, significantly colder than they do in Napa. They have the Pacific there. You know, just kind of being the, the ultimate arbiter regulating everything temperature-wise around them and keeping them in a pretty uh, predictable pattern weather-wise. Whereas we can go from, you know, in, in October from, you know, 
90 something degrees one day to 17 degrees the next night. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. But um, so where can we buy wine in Texas more specifically in, in, in Dallas, in the Dallas area? Well, we do sell through Central Market. Uh, so Central Market does have some, some representation of our wines in the Dallas area, but we're direct to consumer. Um, so anytime, you know, for John uh, there, if you buy wine on our website, it ships out same day as long as you buy before three o'clock and it will get to you next business day everywhere in Texas with the exception of really far west out in El Paso because that's 900 miles away. Um, so you're saying, uh, John asked, you're saying you do not use any grapes from other regions in your wines, Texas only. That's correct. That's correct. Um, so for many years now, we've been exclusively Texas grown as far as our wines go. Um, because for us, it really, you know, there is a goal in making wine to express a sense of place. Um, and, you know, part of that sometimes often even ties into like local cuisine, you know, can we make a wine designed to, to pair with our local cuisine, uh, for instance, barbecue? Um, and if we can do that, utilizing grapes and agriculture uh, grown around us, I think that deepens that, that sense of place. Um, so yeah, we do use 100% Texas grown grapes only. Um, like I mentioned in our first year, when we had Adam Lee kind of holding hands, uh, or holding my hand and, you know, teaching me a little bit about making wine and helping us build inventory. He made some out of state wines for us. But uh, ever since I took over as head winemaker, we've used hundred percent Texas grown grapes. Um, do El Nino's or, or La Nino's uh, affect the grapes? Yeah, they can, you know, I mean, we're affected by precipitation. Um, ideally, you know, what we'll do, you know, um, disease pressure is a factor. So rainy years can, can really increase the challenge of the farmer to keep mold and mildew off the fruit, um, especially in warmer regions like here in the hill country. Um, so yeah, wetter, wetter and drier weather patterns um, do have a big effect on, on growing grapes for us. And in general, uh, for us, after we get fruit set and the berries start to take on color and we're really in our ripening phase, we don't want a whole lot of rain. We have the ability to irrigate, which lets us get the plant enough water to grow, uh, but it won't cause us to bury, swell, and burst, um, and it won't cause us a whole lot of, of ambient air moisture, which will yield uh, disease pressure. So, yeah. Um, all right. I think, should we move on to the next wine, Cam? What do you think? Hey, Cooper, we actually have one, one question that came in the Q&A part of the chat. Um, okay. Jordan wanted to know, uh, Farmville and Austin are obviously two very different places. Uh, this area in general, um, very different from being farther out west. What aspects of your life in this area have you found to be most useful in adapting to your Austin life or your career as a winemaker? Okay. Hmm. I would say part of the appeal of living in Austin is that nobody is from here. So this is a city that has doubled its population. It's added a million people in 10 years. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, it's also a city that has done that based on, you know, kind of on the backs of a reputation of uh, being very accepting of whatever and whoever you want to be. Um, so part of the appeal in moving here, you know, was that, or is, is for a lot of people that, you know, if you have a little bit of farm bill imbued into you, that's okay. Uh, no one will judge you for that. So, you know, there are people from much stranger places. Um, but, um, you know, growing up in, in farm bill and, and watching, watching it grow, there are things that I miss. Like, uh, I swear, like the oldest building in this city is like 40 years old. So it's really weird to go back home and, and see places like, you know, Hampton, Sydney with buildings that are from centuries ago. Um, you know, and so it's kind of, it's a refreshing juxtaposition to, to go back home and, you know, and see that you know, old buildings are repurposed and stuff like that. Whereas down here, uh, the, I think the concept economically is to build first um, rather than repurpose. So, yeah. What's up? You can grab something if you need. Oh, yeah. Is, is Bree here? Huh? Is Bree here? No, he's okay. in the ring. Oh, yeah. No, so we'll say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> 
where somebody popped in to grab some cases. Cooper, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, facility there that you're in? Did yeah. you uh, build it from the ground up uh, to your no. specs or did you buy out a location and kind of make it your own? So we were actually, we're still renters, you know, okay. um, and the commercial real estate uh, business here sucks because it is a very popular place to move. Um, so we pay, you know, between us chickens, you know, we pay well over $10,000 a month in rent for our building. Um, we're in a 5,000 square foot. I'll pop out here. Hopefully not bother people too much. So let's see if I can flip my camera around. So there we go. So we're in a 5,000 square foot. Uh, it's essentially a general steel building, um, which used to be a machine shop called Traxxas Manufacturing. Oh, there's my girlfriend. Say hi, we're on camera. Um, so you see, we've got everybody kind of separated out by table and everything like that. Um, we've got a little projector to try to keep people entertained, keep the sports on, whatever sports decide to come back. But uh, all of my winemaking facilities and stuff are kind of blended in with the tasting facilities. So everything is mobile, as you can see. I keep light tables and chairs. Uh, all my barrels and, and other equipments are on racks so that they're movable during the day. We'll go back and sell it here so I can speak a little louder. Um, so for us here, you know, as far as our facilities go, uh, and as far as winemaking goes, old school is best school as far as I'm concerned. Uh, part of what is unique about wine is that I can try to replicate something that has been made from 6,000 BC. Um, and one of the things that, that we do to do that, in fact, I'll show you all this before we dive into that. Is with this sucker. So that was uh, what we call an amphora, or some people call it a cuervi, um, old school Georgian winemaking vessel, which was the first, I guess if you want to call it tank, uh, for specifically for making wine. Uh, and this is before we knew anything about fermentation science or, or anything like that. Um, and we have, again, we have evidence of these things being used for winemaking as early as 6,000 BC in Georgia, Armenia, um, and in Mesopotamia as well, um, all over the place, really. They're still finding them buried in the ground. Um, and what's old is new again. Uh, you know, this, this day and age, it's really hard to impress people with your technological capability and your scientific knowledge, especially when it comes to a more romantic-driven beverage like wine. Um, so we kind of dove back into really old-world methodology had one of those things commissioned. Uh, it's made from terracotta. It breathes a lot. Um, so you will make oxidative styles of wine, um, but it does kind of have its, its own unique aspects in that I can't sanitize it. Um, so it is essentially building up a bacterial resume year after year. So every wine that we fill uh, will add character to the amphora, which will, it will pass on Know, into the future vintages of wine that are put in it later on, later down the line. Um, so whenever I, you know, if I press grapes into there, or if I if I press off uh, skins and fill it with just juice and ferment in there, I don't need to pitch yeast. There's a strong enough yeast colony uh, naturally living in the pores of of the ceramic um, that will take over and do do the job just fine. Um, and that is an example of X actually that's a great segue into our our red wine here. So, uh, let me see here. All right. Got a couple of questions I'll address as I fish out my opener. Texas is a state of mind left leg in the world. Cheers to that. Uh, Stan, how do we pay our employees during the lockdown? Uh, we are very, very fortunate. We were able to keep all of our employees on staff, um, even part-time employees, because we switched over to a pickup and delivery model. Um, so we were offering free delivery. 
Um, so they might have had to drive a little bit around town um, and, and burn gas. But uh, like I mentioned before, all of our part-time employees have equity, uh, or sorry, all of our full-time employees have equity in, in the company uh, and also have health insurance through the company. So everyone was able to stay on uh, because the cash flow was, was strong enough from, from our more loyal customers and family and friends um, that everyone could, could stay insured. They may have made more money on unemployment, it turns out. But, uh, you know, who knows if they had gotten sick, you know. All right. Cool. All right. Alyssa asked, which, which of the grapes from the full natty makes it so fruit forward? Um, hang on. We'll introduce oh. Brianna um, here. This is my girlfriend, Bri. Hi. She is drinking yeah. non-alcoholic water. Because you have homework. Did you finish? Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, well, she's joining us uh, just to be a good, a good team player. Separated spots. Um, so we had a question here. Uh, which of the grapes from the full natty makes it so fruit forward? So let's, let's dive into that one. So I'll kind of show you all the blend. I'm bad at this, figuring out where the camera is. Blend percentage here is all listed down the side next to the name. It is predominantly Grenache, 78% Grenache, 11% Syrah, and 11% Mouvedre. Um, and as far as the fruit forward aspect of this wine goes, that would be almost certainly contributed by the Grenache. Um, Grenache is a beautiful, very light skinned, very thin skinned, highly aromatic red grape uh, that is commonly used to make rosés, but is also often used to make uh, red wines and most often is used in blending for its aromatic potential. Um, so when I showed you all the M4 earlier, it was kind of to talk a little bit about ancient winemaking techniques. Um, and this wine utilizes one of those in a different capacity. When we make red wines, all of the color that you see in the wine is gonna be contributed by the skin of the grape. Uh, the juice on the inside of the berry is, is always going to be clear with the exception of a few really odd uh, grape varietals out there called Tinteria varietals that we don't work with and they're not especially common for making wine these days. Um, the great like the juice on the inside of the grape is going to be clear the color that you get yielded into your wine is going to all be from skin contact time so what relationship are we establishing with the juice and the skins are we crushing them are we crushing part of the clusters that we've picked um, are we foot treading are we pressing them right away and in the Grenache here, we chose to emulate a style of wine produced in the Beaujolais region of France called Beaujolais Nouveau. Now, uh, in, in Beaujolais Nouveau, what they'll do is they will take whole clusters of red grapes and never crush them. Uh, what they'll do is they'll leave them on the stem. They have to be hand harvested to do this, by the way. Uh, and a significant portion, the majority of our wines uh, are hand harvested. Uh, there, there are a few exceptions when we're taking in large tonnages uh, or if the grape grower has a harvester uh, hired uh, that they will harvest by machine, but we prefer to hand harvest. Um, and the Grenache is an, an example of that where we hand harvest and then typically after that you would take grapes and destem them, figure out some way to take the stems out of your must because the stems will have very vegetal, very bitter and very green flavors that they'll imbue in to your wine. Um, but in the making of uh, carbonic macerated wine, we leave the berries on the stems. We use whole clusters and we put them into tank gently, trying not to break any of the berries open so that the juice does not run. We'll seal the tank and we'll purge the environment of all oxygen. So we use dry ice and bottled CO2 to do this. Um, and what that will do is it will force uh, in anaerobic conditions, intracellular fermentation. So on the inside of each berry, the juice will start to ferment. Uh, it will yield a very small amount of alcohol. 
because this is an enzymatic fermentation rather than uh, a yeast-driven fermentation. Um, and after we achieve about 1% alcohol, which was about 14 days spent locked up in tank under CO2 for this wine, um, and, and we start to see berries swelling, bursting, that's when we'll take them out and we'll stick them straight into the press. Uh, when we press off, there's not a whole lot of skin contact then. It's the only skin contact you'll get is from juice running through the skins on their way to the bottom of the press to be pumped out into, into barrel. Um, but uh, for this wine, 78% of it, so 100% of the Grenache, uh, which is 78% of this wine, was put through carbonic maceration. But the other two varietals used, the Syrah and the Mouvedre, were done in a more traditional winemaking fashion, meaning we hand harvested the grapes, we destemmed them, um, using a, a crusher December machine, which is uh, essentially a very expensive uh, dryer. It's, it's literally just a metal cylinder perforated with holes. It has usually a little arm that runs through the middle of that cylinder with rubber agitators that spin around, and that cylinder will tumble, knocking berries off of the stem, and the berries will fall through the perforations in the cylinder to the bottom of the machine, where they will either be crushed or you can turn off your crusher and then do a foot crush, which is what we did for this. Um, so I apologize to everyone, but they've, they've had my size 12s in, in all of these wines. So, um, but we do sanitize our feet before we go in. We're not crazy people. Um, so yeah, yeah, just extra flavor. Um, so the Syrah and the Mouvedre that are blended in were done in traditional open bin ferments with destemmed grapes that were foot tread. Um, all ambient yeast, we do not add yeast. Um, we do not add acid. There's no sulfur dioxide used at any point in the process. Um, so the volatile acidity on this style of winemaking tends to be a little bit higher, which can sometimes you know, yield sharper aromas and flavors um, or a more oxidative uh, aroma and mouthfeel. Um, but this is what you call a natural wine, which we, we label in the front here when we say when we say full natty, um, just meaning that these grapes were from a farm that practices minimal input um, and the wine was produced in a way that is designed to add nothing to the wine, with the whole theory being that all the flavors you experience and all the aromas you experience in the wine are purely a product of, of the vintage, the growing year, the environment, uh, vineyard management techniques. Um, rather than any input from myself personally in trying to bring out certain flavors or anything like that. Um, so we had a couple of questions pop up here. Oh, what's up, Elizabeth? Cheers. Is there a technique to crushing grapes with feet? Uh, yeah, there is actually. Uh, with a whole foot. Yeah. Um, well, really, really when we do... Uh, we ferment in half ton increments. So our, our bins, our open bins, they'll hold 1,000 pounds of on-stem grapes, which ends up, ends up being about three and, a half, three and a half, four feet thick. So when you're foot crushing, you're really just, just kind of breaking the surface uh, grapes. You're not really penetrating super deep down you know, in, into the bin. So one thing that's helpful is to do it progressively. When we first pull in fruit into the winery, we will break the top X percentage of grapes um, to try to kind of just get juice flowing, get a medium for our yeast to work through um, and get fermentation started and develop a large yeast colony. After that, we'll come back the next day, do a little bit more, the next day do a little bit more and progressively both by continuing to foot crush and by continuing to expose the grape skins to the acidic medium of the juice as it, as it becomes wine, and that breaking down kind of the, the cell wall, the berry, um, making it a little easier to crush and a little easier to extract flavors, aromas, and colors, um, those things kind of all add up. Um, and also re-releasing sugar into our fermentation to prolong our skin contact. Um, so those kind of things all, all add up to, uh, to the, the quote technique of, of crushing grapes with feet to do it successfully. Um, thank you, Parker, for the, the, the Grenache. Um, 
I will say the Grenache. Man, I'm really struggling with my little iPad stand here. I'm sorry, guys. Um, every winery wants and every grape grower hates. There's some stuff like Malvasia Bianca that we tasted in the Friends with Benefits. Um, I could plant this, you know, in the desert of Morocco. You could plant this in the Mediterranean, uh, you know, wetter regions of northern Spain, uh, west Texas, everything like that. Um, and it will find a way to be happy. Not all grapes are like that. Grenache is one of those. Um, so while it is fantastic in the winery because we can make a variety of different wines from it, from beautiful floral light rosés because of light skin contact and the light color that the berry naturally produces, um, to really aromatic red wines using it in, in some sort of blending percentage like we did here. Um, it's wonderful in the winery. It's incredibly vigorous in the vineyard. So it's very labor intensive. It's a very involved vine where you're gonna have to leaf pull you're going to have to thin your crop so that it doesn't produce too much. Um, when you're trying to make commercial quality wine, you're going to have yields much lower than you would if you were producing like table wine or table grapes that, that you get at the grocery store where the idea is to produce as much as possible. Um, so something like Grenache is actually, you know, naturally will put off lots and lots of flowers that will yield lots and lots of grapes but you have to trim back quite a bit of it or drop a lot of it later on in the season as fruit in order to focus your your kind of photosynthetic capacity of the plant into ripening that fruit um, otherwise grenache will spread its efforts a little bit too thin and it will be too light in flavor and it won't really come through for you with any kind of impactful aromas and flavors um, so it's one that's you know, typically a little bit more on the expensive side because of just the agronomics behind it um, and the fact that uh, you know, it's a very involved, very hands-on uh, vine. But this is a style, I love this style. Um, we cannot produce Pinot Noir here to save our life. Pinot Noir relies on good acidity. We don't generally get good acidity in our fruit because it's very hot here for very much of the year. Um, and those, those colder climates where the plants can really hang on to their acids, um, that doesn't happen as much for us. Um, but Grenache can help us produce that kind of sexy, silky smooth style as far as you know, the tannin sensation and everything, the aromatic potential goes, um, you know, that will kind of emulate a little bit of, of what you get out of, especially like Central Coast, Pinot Noir in California. Um, how does the CO2 in dry ice affect tannins or does it have any impact? Uh, Gus had asked. Um, CO2 won't affect our tannins as much. Uh, what will affect our tannin are really berry development. So is it a large berry or is it a small berry? Um, number of seeds two, three, four seeds. Uh, they vary depending on varietal, depending on site. Um, uh, weather patterns. Do we have good development in our skins? Uh, sunburn, raisining, other things like that that will affect our ratio of juice to skins in our must. Um, all of that will affect our tannin level, but our CO2 and, and dry ice should not affect our, our tannin sensation or extraction in our wine. Um, yeah. Um, so Parker asks, I live in New Orleans. Is our wine available here or in Southern Louisiana? Unfortunately not. So we had to, uh, we had some orders that came through that unfortunately we did have to cancel only because, um, well, we don't want to break the law, get our, our TABC permit uh, uh, revoked we have to buy on a state-by-state -state basis when it comes to shipping direct to consumer with wine. Some states are very easy, and it's usually states that have a strong wine industry, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, Virginia. It's typically you know, some small amount to pay per year, some amount of taxes, and then you send them a nice letter and they're cool with it. There are some states, um, you know, in, especially in the Bible Belt, 
that don't want to allow a lot of out of state shipping of alcohols. And so they make it a little bit more difficult for you. Um, so if we don't have a large customer base there, it can be hard for us uh, to uh, justify the, the cost of licensing uh, per state. Oh, okay. Oh, I, missed a few. I missed a few questions here. I'm sorry. Oh, so Cam had asked earlier, how do you market your wines, you know, you know, market your wines in a way that excites people, experience, and novice to your location? Uh, we do that through education. Um, so like I mentioned before, we're, we're a winemaking cooperative. So everybody that works here full-time makes wine. And it won't say the Austin winery on their label. They make wine for themselves. We want people to express themselves. Uh, that also deepens their relationship with wine and deepens their education in wine. And so when they have customers come into the tasting room that they're serving and they're talking about it, they can passionately answer questions uh, because they've had to consider all those things themselves. Um, so there, there is that. And I think it really kind of you know, helps imbue another kind of deeper sense of loyalty uh, to the Austin winery from our employees. Um, Linda had asked, are you still making workhorse? Yes, we are. It is our most popular red wine. We do a, a traditional Bordeaux style blend of Merlot and Petit Verdot, which sells out quickly every year. Um, we did work with a vineyard, a new vineyard this year that, that we helped plant in La Mesa, Texas, that is uh, gonna be providing all the fruit for the workhorse uh, from here on um, because they can grow a lot more than what we were getting off of our smaller vineyards we were working with before. Um, as fantastic as they were, that label just kind of outgrew the production capabilities of some of those growers. Um, so we just bought a workhorse last week and it will be available on our web store by, by the middle of this coming week. Um, so Eric asked, I lived in Amarillo, how close are the vineyards to Amarillo? Um, so Eric, we, most of our vineyards we work with are in Tahoka, Texas, uh, which is about half an hour south of Lubbock. So it's not, it's not too far from you. You're, just, you're a little bit further north than that. Um, there are vineyards in Amarillo. I just don't have a relationship with anybody growing grapes in, in that region. Uh, just yet, but we're still young, still exploring. Um, I'm also a constant tinkerer, so I work with new vineyards every year um, and have a hard time really committing uh, to, to too many things. So that's why there are only a couple of wines that we've made, you know, Workhorse, Friends with Benefits, um, Little Petit Verde Blend, uh, Tempranillo. Those are really the only three wines that we consistently make every year. Outside of that, I reserve the right to uh, explore and make erratic decisions. All right. All right. So Gus, Gus says, I love these two. What wines would you suggest for my next order? Um, so Gus, we have, uh, I would say, give canned wine a chance. Uh, let me go and grab one of these suckers real quick and show you all what we got going. It, it seems wild uh, just to have wine in a can. It's certainly not romantic, uh, but for certain types of wine, this is really like a, a, a better vessel, to be honest. Um, so there is an idea here behind, behind the bottle and, and cork in that we are developing a relationship with oxygen over time. Oxygen can diffuse its way through the cork. It's also trapped in, in, you know, in the cork material itself and will dissolve into the wine over time. Um, and sometimes that's the goal. You have a wine that's incredibly tannic um, and it needs a little bit of, of time and oxygen exposure to smooth off. So with a little bit of bottle age, often you can achieve that and then either wait, keep it in the cellar before you start selling it or recommend people decant it or hold on to it before they drink it. Um, and then you have certain styles of wine where the goal is to keep oxygen out. And that is the case with certain types of white wines, um, certain types of rosé, uh, like our friend the Pink Salt here. Uh, pink Salt being sort of a shout out to the Albarino, which is the predominant grape in this blend. Uh, the High Plains region of Texas um, used to be underwater. So despite it being very far inland, several hundred miles inland, um, Albarino, which, like I mentioned before, became famous for that salty character uh, in, in Rios Baixas um, and you know, in coastal regions of Spain, 
um, because of the Mediterranean influence, we still find, I personally find that because of strong mineral deposits being that the Texas High Plains used to be ocean poor. Um, so, Alyssa asked, are you gonna come back and recreate O'Grady's wine tasting seminar on campus someday? I didn't have the GPA to get into O'Grady's program, all right? Uh, embarrassingly, I didn't. Um, but, oh man, I really wish I would have been able to take advantage of that you know, and, and learn a little bit more um, about, about what, what Dr. O'Grady had to say. Um, but yeah, um, did you have a question, Cam? Or? Uh, Cooper, we have a question in the Q&A. Um, okay. Eric Rasmussen wanted to know, uh, what does this Grenache pair best with and uh, at what temperature is it served? Yeah. The ideal. Okay, cool. Um, so Eric, I, I would say uh, for this wine, as far as food goes, it is light and smooth, but it does have softer acidity. Um, typically for red wines, when we're pairing and wines in general, you know, you, one of the main considerations is your acidity level and juxtaposing that with, with fat and moisture content of whatever you're eating. Um, I like this with pastas actually, um, you know, being that it doesn't have an incredibly strong acidity to it. Um, I find that with like a red sauce or something like that, um, a food that already has a strong natural acidity to it, um, that it can be a nice juxtaposition next to that. So we made a bolognese last night that was killer. Uh, my neighbor actually brought over tomatoes. All of mine got stolen by some critters. So uh, that was also awesome. was a very, very nice gesture. As far as temperature goes, you can serve things too cold. You know, there are things that will mute aromas and flavors. Um, but uh, really your, your preference and what you like to drink wine at um, is the best temperature. I would say don't necessarily serve this at French temp. I'd say aromatically it has a lot going on. Part of that, you know, that kind of like uh, bubble gummy aroma imbued by the carbonic maceration of the Grenache would be really muted at a colder temperature. So I serve this at cellar temperature, 55, 60 degrees, maybe 20, 30 minutes in your fridge, something like that. Um, and we got another question here. Eric isn't 21, it's his parents. Okay. <laughs> nice. Um, That's okay. Cooper, I, I have a question for you. I've had a, a lot of people text me during this event and say they can't wait to come visit you out in Austin and everything. Sure. Are, are yeah. there uh, certain events that you do at your uh, your 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 winery there that people would want to like timing wise try to make sure that they're in the area at a certain time, or is there a best time of year to come travel out to Austin and enjoy wine? Or yeah, well the oh man the past this COVID stuff this this is bullshit like. Like the events industry is, is struggling. So, you know, obviously they shut down our tasting room. They shut down all restaurants. Uh, they canceled South by Southwest, which we get over a hundred thousand tourists in town for, um, remains to be seen for the, for the, for the, the near future, what effect this will have on, on events. Now, if we are to return to normal, uh, we do host a, a rotating concert series called So Far Sounds. Um, they'll come through probably once every other month. Um, so Far Sounds is a pop-up concert series where they'll have three to four artists performing three to four songs per click. Um, we'll clear out all the tables and chairs and provide blankets uh, or encourage people to bring blankets and do picnic seating and stuff like that. Um, grab wine and listen to a variety of music which you might not ordinarily have gone to see live. Uh, so they'll always pair, you know, you know, they'll have everything from pop to country to hip hop to, to rock to bluegrass, um, all playing side by side, just a couple of songs per artist. So it keeps things moving quickly and, and provides an interesting uh, mix of different types of music. Hmm. Oh, this is drinking great. Awesome. Well, we're, uh, we're um, a little over top of the hour. So, if you have anything, uh, any like last uh, 
bitter remarks or anything. Uh, I mean, you, I, I could keep doing this all night. It's been a lot of fun. I know everyone's enjoyed it. I've gotten a sure. text messages and people saying how, how, how much fun it's been to be here with you tonight. Good. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I hope I didn't ramble too much. That's uh, no, no. Part, part of what I like about this job is that it's, uh, there's no rules. It's very unstructured. So somebody whose brain jumps all over the place, I can kind of do that. I can come in one day, work on one thing on the next, the next, um, and just kind of, you know, dictate how things go. I will say kind of the, the future for us, um, here is we are scouting land right now. Um, hopefully the, the goal is to plant a vineyard of our own. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I did at my house, um, I planted a tiny vineyard, which um, I'm producing my own side label of wines. Um, so aside from my professional obligation to make wines for the Austin winery, make sure that we make money, make sure that our employees make money and stuff like that. I am producing a small side label of wines, which I'm calling Long Live. Um, I've produced one white wine from Malvasia Bianca uh, this year, um, and I'll be producing Tempranillo um, off of what is going to be the first organically certified uh, vineyard in Texas. Um, so keep an eye out for those things uh, to come up in, in the near future here. Oh, we got another question here. What is the main difference in wineries in Texas versus those in Virginia taste? Um, you know, to tell you the truth, they have, they have more in common than they have uh, than they are apart. Um, being that both of us are growing grapes in what is considered a high disease pressure area. The East Coast is incredibly humid. Um, so shout out to grape growers there. Um, it's a very difficult job on the East Coast to keep mold and mildew from chewing all your fruit up. Um, soil types can certainly be different. In the high plains, you're going to see uh, fine sandy loam, um, Amarillo loam, uh, sandy loam number two, some people call it, uh, typically about three feet of that red, dusty looking soil on top of limestone bedrock. Um, and then down here in the hill country, you're going to find more clay loam, uh, but you'll also find a, a wide variety depending on how close you are to water sources. Um, but in Virginia, especially in central Virginia, I don't know as much about growing grapes or making wine there. I've just never done it. Um, but I, I just, I mean, I distinctly remember clay being a thing there. So clay locks up a lot of water. Uh, so rainfall can probably be a big issue, watering down fruit, uh, providing too much. Uh, there's a, a phrase that we use in the industry here that uh, a lazy vine makes shit wine. So an element of struggle, um, often you know, having to do from a little bit of drought can produce concentrated flavors in your fruit. Um, and since all of your unique character so when i talked earlier about it's all about the skins when it comes to making red wine what makes merlot taste like merlot or makes grenache take like taste like grenache all those unique esters and, and flavonoids and other compounds that give this unique character are all locked up in the skins the juices is, is some sort of combination of, of sugar acid and water uh, but the winemaker's goal is to coax aromas and flavors out of the skins and so if you have watered down fruit you know, from big fat berries that have great water access or have lots of rain near harvest, um, you're going to lose concentration of flavor and then your varietal character in the skins is kind of going to be lost a little bit. So that's a big challenge on the East Coast, especially being that they're harvesting a little later than we are down here because it's not quite as warm and you're getting into hurricane season as, uh, as people are pulling fruit off the vine, which can obviously cause torrential downpours of rain. Hey, uh, Cooper, the Rasmussen's want to know if, uh, if they were to do more orders with friends around the country, would it be possible to do more virtual tastings like this? Oh, I'm down. Yeah, for sure. Great. I got a brand new iPad just for this. So <laughs> we can do that. I don't have a computer at home, but uh, just because I'm, I'm an analog guy, but, uh, but we can definitely do it. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. We need to do a Hampton Sydney event uh, at your spot there in Austin. That'd be a good time. For sure. As soon as we can get everybody together again for uh, 
you know, college sanctioned alumni events, we'll have to get in touch and try to host something. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any more last minute questions here that, that I can field? Let's see. Um, Brian Kern, are you there or what? Yeah, where's all the mischief? Yeah. Yeah, that's all the questions I see. Cool. Um, and just to, just to follow up a little bit on, on Kira West's uh, question about the difference between Texas and Virginia, we share a lot of the same grape varietals. Uh, Viognier uh, is, a, is a major player here. It makes fantastic wines both in Virginia and in Texas. Um, some of the really early budding varietals, like Chardonnay, so before a grape bunch is a bunch, it's a flower. Um, we have trouble here with spring frost. So believe it or not, it's not uncommon for us in the hill country here to, to have a freeze um, in, you know, March or even April sometimes. Um, yeah, we had hail a couple weeks ago. Um, so early budding varietals like Chardonnay don't do as well here, but they do fantastic on the East Coast where this, you know, the spring nighttime temperatures don't dip down quite as, as severe. Um, uh, but San Gervese, which you'll find in the Charlottesville area in central Virginia, does fantastic in Texas too. It's a personal favorite of mine uh, for, for making wine here in Texas. I love San Gervese. Um, so yeah, oh, oh, lived in Bernie. Okay, just bought a farm in Farmville or some wine. will be a senior at HSC this fall. Excellent, that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Well, be sure, be sure to hit us up next time you come back into town. And uh, you bought a farm in Farmville. If you want to plant some vines, let me know, and I'll be happy to connect y'all with somebody, somebody there. Um, there are a lot of resources, you know, that are available just through your your state-driven agriculture departments, uh, as far as soil analysis and stuff like that goes. Texas has done a really good job of trying to make it easy for people to farm here. So um, hopefully, it's the same case in the state of Virginia. Super, we've got to get you to Virginia, get you to campus and do a on-campus tasting for a big game weekend or a, a reunion or something like that. I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. It'd be a blast. Bree will get you down and show you a good Hampton Sydney uh, tailgate experience. <laughs> for sure. I can yeah, I'll I'll bring I'll bring the staff. You know, we can we can make a day out of it for sure. It'd be great. Well, thank you again for doing this. I think we've uh let me double check here, make sure we've got the Rasmussen's are ready for a mom's trip after the quote, the kids go back. So <laughs> I think you're, <laughs> I think you have some new customers here. Um, yeah, I think we're all really grateful. This was so much fun, Cooper. Thanks for doing this. Good. Yeah. I hope it was informative. Um, and next time we do it, uh, hopefully I can take y'all just a little bit, a little bit more around the facilities and stuff like that. Just being that I had customers at the moment, I didn't want to bother them too much. Well, we're just going to come see you in person and be a customer. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, ideally. Yeah. Awesome. Well, y'all have a great night. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us a lot of great information about wine. And uh, this was an awesome tasting with the two recommendations that you shipped out to everybody. And um, this was just a really good, organic, natural, easy, fun event for the evening on a Friday. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Really appreciate it. Well, well, cheers, Cam. Thank you for putting this on. And, uh, you know, thank you to the college and the college community for supporting me. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here. Um, this COVID thing has kind of given us a, you know, sort of an advanced chance of reflection and uh, appreciation for, you know, our, the support network that's around us. Um, you know, and it wouldn't have been possible if, if uh, people weren't chiming in and, and keeping the dream going for young entrepreneurs like myself. So, um, you know, always support people uh, around you it's really one of the most beautiful parts about America is we have a very can do attitude. So whatever you love, there's probably somebody around you that's trying to pursue a career in it. So support them if you can. Awesome. Great closing words. I appreciate it, Cooper. Y'all take care. Thanks everyone who got on and joined us tonight and made this event such a great success. And uh, I hope yeah. you have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. Go Tigers. For sure. Yeah. Cheers. Go Tigers. Mm -hmm. All right. Adios.